Well, thank you so much for asking me to give the charge to the class of 2014. It means a lot to me, it really does, to uh, get to do this because I really do think so highly of this class. But I must admit that was not always the case. <laughs> uh, I'm thinking back to when we started this journey three years ago together and I recall how concerned I was. I remember Whitmore with her brightly colored, <laughs> brightly colored feathers in her hair. I recall Akers and that goofy accent and his naive belief in justice and fairness. Uh, I recall the fate of slap. I don't know if others recall that. I recall having to advise camp that she probably shouldn't put on her resume, able to reach things in high places <laughs> as one of her skills. Um, I remember uh, Patterson trying to explain to me how he wound up at the University of Alabama, even though he's not from Alabama. <laughs> Is Patterson here? Uh, I recall all those seating chart changes I had to make because of the relationships that went sour. <laughs> But I won't mention any names on that, but you know who I'm talking about, right? I could go on, so I will. <laughs> I remember Cataldo taking advantage of the youth of New York City for his own personal gain. <laughs> yes, I remember Leshevsky and his caps, which he didn't d disappoint today. Thank you. Don't worry if I haven't mentioned you by name. I may later. Uh, and I certainly haven't forgotten all of the crazy things you guys have said and done. And I'm prepared to use that against you if you stop contributing to the law school. All right? Now, it's because I know that so many of you are such flawed human beings that your achievements in law school are so very impressive. Um, I mean, if you got to know Ward and Kilberg, who would have ever thought they would clerk for Judge Wilkinson? I mean, uh, yet, somehow they are, right? That is truly impressive. Right? Some of you were smart enough to know your own limits, know that you should marry someone smarter than yourself. Yes, Wood, I'm talking about you. Uh, that kind of self-knowledge is also truly impressive. Right? Despite all of your flaws, you somehow turned out to be one of the most impressive group of students I've ever had the privilege of teaching, getting to know, and insulting. Uh, and I mean that. Uh, after getting to know you, I've come to realize that lots of you are a lot like me. You're not very attractive. If you have a personality, it's not a very flattering one. And you're only marginally intelligent. Yet somehow, you've had great success in life. Because we're so much alike, I thought you might benefit from some of the things I've learned over my own 25 years in the law. Some of the thoughts I'm going to give you today uh, will probably sound obvious or unoriginal, or they may not seem that they even are that important, but it's taken me 25 years to understand that uh, these ideas really are important, and they are serious. There's a serious side to this. So I hope you'll listen to some of these 10 principles I have to living a happy and productive life in the law. And uh, maybe they'll make a little difference in the next few years and uh, you'll get wiser faster than I did, okay? All right. Principle number one, work harder than everyone else, or at least harder than the person in the office next to you or the attorney on the other side of the case. Now, notice what I did not say. I did not say be smarter than the person in the office next to you. As you no doubt will agree, I am not as smart as many of the law professors here, but I am a testament to the fact that you can make up for even big intelligence deficits by hard work. Uh, I won my first jury trial because after the second day of trial, uh, I stayed up all night looking for a single document out of about a million documents. I was uh, cross-examining uh, the key witness for the plaintiffs in my first jury trial in federal court, and I had a killer document, a copy of a killer document, and during my cross-examination, uh, as I was trying to destroy the plaintiff's case, to my surprise, 
This key witness claimed that the document was faked and went into minute detail about how the fonts in one section didn't match and it was obvious it was a cut and paste job and just a very minute description of all the indicia of fakery in front of the jury and given who my client was at the time I had my own suspicions after he said this uh, <laughs> frankly uh, so that night uh, just to verify my suspicions that night I contacted the US attorney who had all of the documents we needed for our case because they had been seized from my client and they allowed me to stay in their office overnight looking for a single original document uh, so I could finish my cross-examination and hopefully find that this was not a fake document. And about the ninth box I went through, I found uh, this one-page document, which was a fax on this thermal paper, which you guys are too young to remember, but it's this heat-sensitive paper that if you just touch, you know it's been smudged. There's no way you can fake it. So I had this document. I had to sign an affidavit to the U.S. attorney that I would bring it back. The next morning, I cross-examined the guy with this with this original of the document and he just wilted right in front of the jury and the jury was willing was able to see that this guy was willing to lie to try to win his case the jury came back in one hour for our side I can assure you I didn't win that case because I was smarter or smoother than the opposing counsel uh, in that case during the trial the judge almost held me in contempt twice <laughs> I'm, in all seriousness almost twice during a break in the evidence he told me, he said, Mr. Mitchell, this was a Southern guy. I'll try to do a Southern accent. <laughs> Mr. Mitchell, you're pirouetting and twirling about. I find very distracting, and I'm sure the jury does too. Uh, I was this whirling dervish in the courtroom. I won that case simply because I worked harder than uh, a lot of people would in the same position and was uh, dogged in my pursuit of that case. And you can do the same, even if you're not that smart. If you work hard, you can get ahead, all right? Principle number two, and this is a serious principle here. Well, that one was serious, but this one's very serious. Principle number two, once your integrity is gone, you'll never get it back. I can't lay claim to authorship of that principle. That was something that Judge Wiseman said to me and to my co-clerks while I was clerking for him early on in my clerkship. And you should all listen to Judge Wiseman. He had a very long career on the bench. He saw what the loss of integrity does to attorneys in their careers. One shortcut to try to win a motion and you're done. Don't do it, right? It'll be tempting, but it's not your facts, it's the client's facts. It's not your law, it's, you didn't make the law, right? Don't cut those corners, don't lose your integrity. Protect and defend your integrity. If someone challenges your integrity, don't walk away from that fight. You've gotta disprove that accusation. It will linger if you don't, okay? Uh, it's going to be impossible to avoid, to avoid ethical dilemmas when you get the, in the middle of these battles. Just go consult somebody you trust and work through it. Just make the right decision. All right. Now, what I'm saying here about integrity is, is not that you need to be a nice attorney. All right. Being nice and having integrity are not the same thing. I know many nice people I would never leave my kids with. And I know many nice attorneys I would never hire as my lawyer, right? I know many tough attorneys I would hire as my lawyer, and all of them have integrity, okay? So you can be nice and have integrity, but you can also be tough and have integrity. Um, principle number three, being mean is fun, but that is probably not a sufficient reason for being mean, right? <laughs> So you're going to, if you haven't already encountered during your summers, you are certainly going to encounter some attorneys who seem to think that having a law license is a license to be a jerk. Uh, some attorneys do wear their opponents down through being difficult, and it can work sometimes. But when you're being difficult and mean just for the sake of being difficult and mean, that is going to come back and haunt you eventually. You're going to need favors uh, from your opponents and from the people who work with you, uh, take them into consideration when you're making your decisions and think about whether you really need to treat people as objects only. There are times when you do need to be tough. There are times when you need to say things that can sound mean or even callous. You gotta show your teeth sometimes so you don't look like a pushover. 
Uh, you're going to need to ask that witness those uncomfortable questions sometimes. Um, but your lawyer's not therapist, right? You got to do what you may not want to do sometimes. Uh, the law may require that. If you don't like conflict, if you would rather trust people than make them prove their cases, if you don't like giving bad news to people, then you shouldn't even go to the graduation ceremony, right? Because <laughs> when you practice law of any kind, not just litigation, you're going to have to deal with a lot of bad news, a lot of tough discussions, a lot of tough decisions. Uh, be nice when you can, but be tough and mean when you have to be, okay? All right. Principle number four, learn to live with mistakes. You are going to make lots and lots of mistakes. How you deal with those mistakes will be much more important than the mistakes themselves. Learn from your mistakes, don't dwell on them. I know some of you, I know this is gonna be hard for some of you. Have a short memory. Let go of the graces in your life, okay? If you've been in my class, you know what I'm talking about, <laughs> right? Worry about getting it right before you get it wrong. That's the adaptive use of fretting and worrying. After the fact, worry is really counterproductive. There's nothing wrong with worrying before the fact, but use it to your advantage. And, and embrace constructive and even destructive criticism. This is something that took me a while to learn. Um, there are people who shy away from it, but you should not shy away from people who are critical of you, even if they're mean when they're critical of you. You should seek that feedback out. Uh, if it's good to know who your enemies are, right? And if you can win over your enemies and your biggest critics, then you are on track for tremendous success. Uh, one of my favorite psychology professors used to say, don't sweat the small stuff and it's all small stuff. Uh, I used to think he was right, but then I realized he was a psychology professor. <laughs> and once I got into the law, I realized that some stuff really is big, important stuff, right? And I realized that lawyers can have a big impact on big, important stuff. You really can. And that means you can make some really monumental mistakes. Right? Some real doozies. Working hard and preparing for the worst is the best way to avoid those doozies, but when they happen, and they will, just move on and become a better lawyer because of them. Uh, it's very hard to do, but you're going to have to learn to live with mistakes. Principle number five, don't whine, fix it. You're going to make mistakes, and others are going to make mistakes that adversely affect you, unfortunately. Judges make errors. Partners make mistakes about hiring, bonuses, promotion. Uh, other attorneys on your team are going to make mistakes that affect the whole team. Clients make bad decisions about what cases and what deals to pursue, and that comes down to you ultimately having bad outcomes often. You can sit around depressed and blame others for your misfortune, or you can work harder to try to make uh, the others see the error of their way and to see the value that you offer. If working harder can't fix the problem, then pursue another course of action to fix it. I can't tell you all the ways that a problem can be fixed, but you're about to have a law degree. That is real power in our society. If you're being harassed, if you're being perpetually overlooked, don't take it. Look for another job. Do what is appropriate to make sure that others don't take advantage of you. Principle number six, don't be arrogant. Other people probably do have some views that are worth listening to, so go ahead and listen before you do what you wanted to do in the first place, all right? You are graduating from the University of Virginia School of Law, so you're probably feeling a bit big for your britches right now with some justification, but there's no justification for being arrogant. You're entering a field, however, of uh, that's full of arrogant, self-important people. You've taken some classes from some of us. Uh, <laughs> these people drove you crazy, and being around more of them is going to drive you even crazier. And you might think that that's the way to succeed, but you are wrong. You are definitely wrong. It's okay to trumpet your successes and your contributions to a project. A little boasting is not a bad idea at all. But that's not the same thing as arrogant. If you think you know more than everyone around you, you're smarter than everyone else, you don't need to listen to the views of everyone else and you become arrogant, right? That is a very dangerous mindset for an attorney. 
Principle number seven, just showing up is sometimes enough to win. Now that principle may seem to conflict with my first principle about working harder, but I'm not contradicting myself when I explain it, okay? So what I'm saying here is to be brave and believe in yourself. I have a great friend from law school who wanted to be a writer and producer rather than a lawyer, which described about half my class at Berkeley. <laughs> um, and which was good since we learned no law there. So, so while Jeff was an associate at Latham and Watkins, he was uh, also, probably during billable time, writing just some terrible stuff <laughs> and submitting it over and over and over to television producers. He even uh, wrote his own musical, produced it in an LA theater. It was called Hound Dog, a, hop, a hip hopera. <laughs> which examines the life of Elvis Presley through rap music. <laughs> it actually was reviewed by the LA Times, if you Google Hound Dog, a hip hopera. It'll probably be the first hit that you get. The LA Times review described the play as imponderable and pointless throughout. <laughs> but Jeff did not let reviews like that stop him. He kept writing, he kept submitting things, and he eventually landed a job writing for Darren Starr's production company. Darren Starr, I'm sure you all know, is the creator of Sex and the City, Melrose Place, Beverly Hills 90210. Uh, and from there, Jeff is now has got multi, has had multiple deals with the main, major studios, and he's extremely successful in Hollywood. But here's the important point. Jeff's writing is fine, but frankly, there's nothing very special about it. Uh, but Jeff had the courage to try and to keep trying and to keep going rejection after rejection after rejection. He just was more dogged and braver than many of his competitors, and it paid off. He just kept showing up. One of my fellow, fellow associates when I practiced law, Jane Allen, uh, thought the law firm model was antiquated. She thought it was bad for clients, bad for lawyers, so she started a company called Counsel on Call in Nashville in the year 2000. Uh, so what, 14 years ago, 13 and a half years ago. That company now has offices in Atlanta, Boston, Chicago, Dallas, Memphis, and Minneapolis, and it has revenue over 20 million a year, all right? Jane's very smart and a very good lawyer, but what Jane uh, sets Jane apart is she is incredibly determined when she sets her mind to something uh, and just won't take no for an answer. I've seen lots of mediocre people succeed. Jeff and Jane are not mediocre. They're better than that. But I've seen lots of mediocre people succeed because they persevere and show up when others don't. So if you want to be a politician, if you want to be an elected judge, run for office. If you want to start your own firm, do it. If you have a great idea for a new business, start the business. Fortune favors the bold. Besides, you'll have a law degree to fall back on if you fail. <laughs> right? So. Principle number eight, don't worry when you have some free time on your hands, you will be plenty busy soon enough. Uh, you are all high achievers, you're used to working hard, in fact I suspect many of you don't know what to do with yourselves now that libel's over, moot court competitions are ending, uh, your memos are all written, you probably aren't even studying for exams anymore, right? So. Uh, I'm sure you don't know what to do with yourselves because you are such high achievers, but you are entering a high-stress profession. No matter what kind of law you practice, uh, even public interest law is very demanding both psychologically and temporally. It's going to eat up your life if you let it. So when you find yourself in a lull at work, don't fret about it. And I promise you this is going to be probably the first of my principles that comes to mind in the next year. Uh, because you're going to say, oh, why am I getting as many assignments as the person down the hall? How am I going to make my billables? As long as you're not screwing up, don't worry about it. You're going to be busier than you want to be soon enough. Um, so if, if you're smart, you will come to treasure those slow times instead of worrying about them. Take a short vacation. Go have lunch with your kids at school. Do something that gives you a mental break when you can if you want to have a long life in the law. Okay. Principle number nine, always try to lower expectations. <laughs> the, 
may be the secret to my success. <laughs> if you think you are sure to win a case, convince the client the case is a loser. If you think the case will settle for $50,000, let the client believe it's going to take $100,000 to buy this claim off. If you think a project will only take two days to complete, but the partner thinks it will take a week, let the partner believe that and then come in under her expectations, right? I'm not saying lie to lower expectations, but where there's uncertainty about an outcome, there's nothing wrong with letting people be pessimistic, right? All judgments are made relative to some context, and you have control over an important part of that context by adjusting the expectations to below where you think you will come in, right? It shouldn't shock you to learn that there is actual psychological research showing people who perform better than expectations consistently receive better ratings than people who perform worse than expectations, even when the second group objectively has performed better, right? So it's judgments are relative to expectations, and you have control over that. Now, there's going to be a temptation for you to be these optimistic booster go-getter types. You know what I'm talking about, right? Uh, Resist that temptation to be one of those people. Who would you rather be? The sunny optimist who told the client that you were going to have a total victory, but you only come in winning one uh, summary judgment on one of the two claims in the complaint? Or would you rather be that gloomy pessimist who's convinced the client all hope is lost and then come in and tell them that you won summary judgment on one of the claims, right? So lower expectations. All right, finally. Principle number 10, the less said, the better. Very soon, you're going to be spending a lot of time with partners and other attorneys who are much more experienced than you. And during these times, you're going to be in airports traveling to a client meeting. You're going to be over at a firm waiting on a, to take a deposition. You're going to have lots of opportunities to speak. Resist that urge. <laughs> Do not fill the need to fill uncomfortable spaces with conversation. The more you open them, your mouth, the greater the chance that you will say something that you will come to regret. Or you will say something that shows how little you know about the case or the law. Right? I know you think you're smooth, you think you're smart, you can handle yourself under pressure. You went to UVA, not Chicago. Right? <laughs> But I've seen it happen time and time again. Young attorneys who are nervous will just prattle on and on and say something that they should not have said or say something that telegraphed to everyone else in the room that they had no idea what was really at stake in the case. This is one of the few bits of advice I've given my wife, who's a, who's a lawyer as well, that she actually thinks is very good advice. So if you don't <laughs> believe me, uh, believe my wife, she actually took this to heart. She's a transactional attorney and she's seen many, many young attorneys uh, dig their own graves by talking too much. Uh, in fact, my wife thinks I should apply this principle to all facets of my life. <laughs> all right, so a corollary to my less said the better principle is to never make long speeches. I hope this speech was not too long. I hope you're smart enough to take my advice and make these principles your new religion. Thank you so much for letting me be one of your professors. Thank you for spending time with me today, and good luck on the bar and in the next phase of your life. Thank you.